morning kids we are going to read two chapters today and they relate to each other one is called speaking of courage and if you have the PDF or if you have a book this starts on page 131 um, even though the PDF pages aren't the same and we're going to read speaking of courage and then the one that goes with it is right after that it's called notes okay and there are questions on Schoology over these chapters so the war was over and there was no place in particular to go. Norman Bowker followed the tar road on its seven-mile loop around the lake. Then he started all over again, driving slowly, feeling safe inside his father's big Chevy, now and then looking out on a lake to watch the boats and water skiers and scenery. It was Sunday and it was summer, and the town seemed pretty much the same. The lake lay flat and silvery against the sun. Along the road, the houses were low-slung and split-level and modern, with big porches and picture windows facing the water. The lawns were spacious. On the lake side of the road, where real estate was most valuable, the houses were handsome and set deep in, well-kept and brightly painted, with docks jutting out into the lake and boats moored and covered with canvas, and neat gardens, and sometimes even gardeners, and stone patios with barbecue spits and grills. Edwin Shingle sang who lived there. On the other side of the road to his left, the houses were also handsome, though less expensive, and on a smaller scale with no docks or boats or gardeners. The road was a sort of boundary between the, the affluent, which means rich, and the, most, and the almost affluent. And to live on the lake side of the road was one of the few natural privileges in a town of the prairie, the difference between watching the sunset over cornfields or over water. It was a graceful, good-sized lake. Back in high school at night, he had driven around and around it with Sally Kramer, wondering if she'd want to pull into the shelter of Sunset Park, or other times with his friends, talking about urgent matters, worrying about the existence of God and theories of causation. Then there had not been a war, but there had always been the lake, which was the town's first cause of existence, a place for immigrant settlers to put down their loads. Before the settlers were the Sioux, and before the Sioux were the vast open prairies, and before the prairies there was only ice. The lake bed had been dug out by the southernmost advance of the Wisconsin glacier field. Fed by neither streams nor springs, the lake was often filthy and algaed, relying on fickle prairie rains for replenishment. Still, it was the only important body of water within 40 miles, a source of pride, nice to look at on bright summer days, and later that evening, it would color up with fireworks. Now in the late afternoon, it lay calm and smooth, a good audience for silence, a seven-mile circumference, that could be traveled by slow car in 25 minutes. It was not such a good lake for swimming. After high school, he caught an ear infection that almost kept him out of the war. And the lake had drowned his friend Max Arnold, keeping him out of the war entirely. Max had been one who liked to talk about the existence of God. No, I'm not saying that, he'd argue against the drone of the engine. I'm saying it's possible as an idea, even necessary as, a, as an idea, a final cause in the whole structure of causation. Now he knew, perhaps. Before the war, they'd driven around the lake as friends, but now Max was just an idea. And most of Norman Bowker's other friends were living in Des Moines or Sioux City or going to school somewhere or holding down jobs. Sally Kramer, whose pictures he had once carried in his wallet, was one who had married. Her name was now Sally Gustafson. And she lived in a pleasant blue house on the less expensive side of the lake road. On his third day home, he'd seen her out mowing the lawn, still pretty in a lacy red blouse and white shorts. For a moment, he'd almost pulled over, just to talk, but instead he'd pushed down hard on the gas pedal. She looked happy. She had her house and her new husband, and there was really nothing he could say to her. The town seemed remote somehow. Sally was married, and Max was drowned, and his father was home watching baseball on national TV. Norman Bowker shrugged. No problem, he murmured. Clockwise, as if in orbit, he took the Chevy on another seven-mile turn around the lake. Even in late afternoon, the day was hot. He turned on the air conditioner, then the radio, and he leaned back and let the cold air and music blow over him. Along the road, kicking stones in front of them, two young boys were hiking with knapsacks and toy rifles and canteens. He honked going by, but neither boy looked up. Already he'd passed them six times, 42 miles, nearly three hours without stop. 
He watched the boys recede in his rearview mirror. They turned a soft brownish color like sand before finally disappearing. He tapped down lightly on the accelerator. Out on the lake, a man's motorboat had stalled. The man was bent over the engine with a wrench and a frown. Beyond the stalled boat, there were other boats and a few water skiers in the smooth July waters and an immense flatness everywhere. Two mud hens floated stiffly beside a white dock. And this would be the real mud hens, not the Toledo baseball players. The road curved west, where the sun had now dipped low. He figured it was close to five o'clock. Twenty after, he guessed. The war had taught him to tell time without clocks. Even at night, waking from sleep, he could usually place it within ten minutes either way. What he should do, he thought, is stop at Sally's house and impress her with this new time-telling trick of his. They talked for a while, catching up on things, and then he'd say, well, better hit the road, it's 534, and she'd glance at her wristwatch and say, hey, how'd you do that? And he'd give her a casual shrug and tell her it was just one of those things you pick up. He'd keep it light. He wouldn't say anything about anything. How's it being married, he might ask, and he'd nod at whatever she answered with, and he would not say a word about how he almost won the Silver Star for Valor. He drove past Slater Park and across the causeway and past Sunset Park. The radio announcer sounded tired. The temperature in Des Moines was 81 degrees and the time was 535. And all you on the road, drive extra careful now on this fine 4th of July. If Sally had not been married or if his father were not such a baseball fan, it would have been a good time to talk. The Silver Star, his father might have said. Yes, but I didn't get it. Almost but not quite. And his father would have nodded, knowing full well that many brave men do not win medals for their bravery, and that others win medals for doing nothing. As a starting point, maybe, Norman Bowker might then have listed the seven medals he did win. The Combat Infantryman's Badge, the Air Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart. Though his wound was minor and did not leave a scar, did not hurt, and never had. He would have explained to his father that none of these decorations was for uncommon valor. They were for common valor. The routine, daily stuff, just humping, just enduring. But that was worth something, wasn't it? Yes, it was worth plenty. The ribbons looked good on the uniform in his closet, and if his father were to ask, he would have explained what each signified and how proud he was of all of them, especially the combat infantryman's badge, because it meant he'd been there as a real soldier and had done all the things soldiers do, and therefore it wasn't such a big deal that he could not bring himself to be uncommonly brave. And then he would have talked about the medal he did not win and why he did not win it. I almost won the Silver Star, he would have said. How's that? Just a story. So tell me, his father would have said. Slowly then, circling the lake, Norman Bowker would have started by describing the song Trabong. A river, he would have said, the slow, flat, muddy river. He would have explained how during the dry season it was exactly like any other river, nothing special, but how in October the monsoons began and the whole situation changed. For a solid week the rains never stopped, not once, and so after a few days the Song Trabong overflowed its banks and the land turned into a deep, thick muck for a quarter mile on either side. Just muck, no other word for it. Like quicksand, almost, except the stink was incredible. You couldn't even sleep, he'd tell his father. At night, you'd find a high spot, and you'd doze off, but then later you'd wake because you'd be buried in all that slime. You'd just sink in. You'd feel it ooze up over your body and sort of suck you down. And the whole time, there was that constant rain. I mean, it never stopped, not ever. Sounds pretty wet, his father would have said, pausing briefly. So what happened? You really want to hear this? Hey, I'm your father. Norman Bowker smiled. He looked out across the lake and imagined the feel of his tongue against the truth. Well, this one time, this one night out by the river, I wasn't very brave. You have seven medals. Sure, seven, count them. You weren't a coward either. Well, maybe not, but I had the chance and I blew it. The stink, that's what got to me. I couldn't take the goddamn awful smell. If you don't want to say any more, I do want to. All right, then, slow and sweet, take your time. Remember, this is like an imaginary conversation he's having with his father.
The road descended into the outskirts of town, turning northwest past the junior college and the tennis courts, then past Chautauqua Park, where the picnic tables were spread with sheets of colored plastic, and where picnickers sat in lawn chairs and listened to the high school band playing Sousa marches under the band show. The music faded after a few blocks. He drove beneath a canopy of elms, then along a stretch of open shore, then past the municipal docks, where women in pedal pushers, which is a kind of pants, stood casting for bullheads. There were no other fish in the lake except for perch and a few worthless carp. It was a bad lake for swimming and fishing both. He drove slowly. No hurry. Nowhere to go. Inside the Chevy, the air was cool and oily smelling, and he took pleasure in the steady sounds of the engine and air conditioning. A tour bus feeling, in a way, except the town he was touring seemed dead. Through the windows, as if in a stop-motion photograph, the place looked as if it had been hit by nerve gas. Everything still and lifeless, even the people. The town could not talk and would not listen. How'd you like to hear about the war, he might have asked, but the place could only blink and shrug. It had no memory, therefore no guilt. The taxes got paid, the votes got counted, the, agen the agencies of government did their work briskly and politely. It was a brisk, polite town. It did not know shit about shit. It did not care to know. Norman Bowker leaned back and considered what he might have said on the subject. He knew shit. It was his specialty. The smell, in particular, but also the numerous varieties of its texture and taste. Someday he'd give a lecture on the topic, put on a suit and tie, and stand up in front of the Kiwanis Club and tell, them, tell all the efforts about the wonderful shit he knew. Pass out samples, maybe. Smiling at this, he clamped the steering wheel slightly right of center, which produced a smooth clockwise motion against the curve of the road. The Chevy seemed to know its own way. The sun was lower now, 5.55, he decided, 6 o'clock, tops. Along an unused railway spot, four workmen labored in the shadowy red heat, setting up a platform and steel launchers for the evening fireworks. They were dressed alike in khaki trousers, work shirts, visored caps, and brown boots. Their faces were dark and smudgy. Want to hear about the silver star I almost won? Norman Bowker whispered, but none of the workmen looked up. Later, they would blow color into the sky. The lake would sparkle with reds and blues and greens like a mirror, and the picnickers would make low sounds of appreciation. Well, see, it never stopped raining, he would have said. The muck was everywhere. You couldn't get away from it. He would have paused a second. Then he would have told about the night they bivouacked in a field along the Song Trabong, a big swampy field beside the river. There was a vill nearby, 50 meters downstream, and right away a dozen old mamasans ran out and started yelling. A crazy scene, he would have said. The mamasans just stood there in the rain, soaking wet, yapping away about how this field was bad news. Number 10, they said, evil ground. Not a good spot for good GIs. Finally, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross had to get out his pistol and fire off a few rounds just to shoo them away. By then it was almost dark, so they set up a perimeter, ate chow, then crawled under their ponchos and tried to settle in for the night. But the rain kept getting worse, and by midnight the field turned into soup. Just this deep, oozy soup, he would have said, like sewage or something, thick and mushy. You couldn't sleep, you couldn't even lie down, not for long because you'd start to sink under the soup, real clammy. You could feel the crud coming up inside your boots and pants. Here, Norman Bowker would have squinted against the low sun. He would have kept his voice cool. No self-pity. But the worst part, he would have said quietly, was the smell. Partly it was the river, a dead fish smell. But it was something else, too. Finally, somebody figured it out. What this was, it was a shit field. The village toilet. No indoor plumbing, right? So they used the field. I mean, we were camped in a goddamn shit field. He imagined Sally Kramer closing her eyes. If she were here with him in the car, she would have said, Stop it. I don't like that word. Well, that's what it was. All right, but you don't have to use that word. Fine. What should we call it? She would have glared at him. I don't know. Just stop it. Clearly, he thought, this was not a story for Sally Kramer. She was Sally Gustafson now. No doubt Max would have liked it, the irony in particular, but Max had become a pure idea, which was its own irony. It was just too bad. If his father was here riding shotgun around the lake, the old man might have glanced over for a second, understanding perfectly well it was not a question of offensive language, but of fact. His father would have sighed, 
and folded his arms and waited. A shit field, Norman Bowker would have said, and later that night I could have won the Silver Star for Valor. Right, his father would have murmured. I hear you. The Chevy rolled smoothly across the viaduct and up the narrow tar road. To the right was open lake. To the left, across the road, most of the lawns were scorched dry like October corn. Hopelessly round and round, a rotating sprinkler scattered lake water on Dr. Mason's vegetable garden. Already the prairie had been baked dry, but in August it would get worse. The lake would turn green with algae, and the golf course would burn up, and the dragonflies would crack open for want of good water. The big Chevy curved past Centennial Beach and the A&W root beer stand. It was his eighth revolution around the lake. He followed the road past the handsome houses with their docks and wooden shingles. Back to Slater Park, across the causeway, around a sunset park, as though riding on tracks. The two little boys were still trudging along on their seven-mile hike. Out on the lake, the man in the stalled motorboat still fiddled with his engine. The pair of mud hens floated like wooden decoys, and the water skiers looked tanned and athletic, and the high school band was packing up its instruments, and the woman in pedal pushers patiently rebated her hook for another try. Quaint, he thought. A hot summer day, and it was all very quaint and remote. The four workmen had almost completed their preparations for the evening fireworks. Facing the sun again, Norman Bowker decided it was nearly seven o'clock. Not much later, the tired radio announcer confirmed it, his voice rocking deep into a deep Sunday snooze. If Max Arnold were here, he'd say something about the announcer's fatigue and relate it to the bright pink in the sky and the war and courage. A pity that Max was gone, and a pity about his father, who had his own war and who now preferred silence. Still, there was so much to say. How the rain never stopped. How the cold worked into your bones. Sometimes the bravest thing on earth was to sit through the night and feel the cold in your bones. Courage was not always a matter of yes or no. Sometimes it came up in degrees, like the cold. Sometimes you were very brave, up to a point, and then beyond that point you were not so brave. In certain situations you could do incredible things, you could advance toward enemy fire, but in other situations, which were not nearly so bad, you had trouble keeping your eyes open. Sometimes, like that night in the shit field, the difference between courage and cowardice was something small and stupid. The way the earth bubbled and the smell. In a soft voice, without flourishes, he would have told the exact truth. Late, late in the night, he would have said, we took some mortar fire. He would have explained how it was raining and how the clouds were pasted to the field and how the mortar rounds seemed to come right out of the clouds. Everything was black and wet. The field just exploded. Rain and slop and shrapnel, nowhere to run, and all they could do was worm down the slime and cover up and wait. He would have described the crazy things he saw, unnatural things, like how at one point he noticed a guy lying next to him in the sludge, completely buried except for his face, and how after a moment the guy rolled his eyes and winked at him. The noise was fierce. Heavy thunder and mortar rounds and people yelling. Some of the men began shooting up flares, red and green and silver flares, all colors, and the rain came down in technicolor. The field was boiling. The shells made deep slushy craters, opening up all those years of waste, centuries worth, and the smell came bubbling out of the earth. Two rounds hit close by, then a third, even closer, and immediately off to his left, he heard somebody screaming. It was Kiowa. He knew that. The sound was ragged and clotted up, but even so, he knew the voice. A strange, gargling noise. Rolling sideways, he crawled toward the screaming in the dark. The rain was hard and steady. Another round hit nearby, sprang up shit and water, and for a few, few moments he ducked down beneath the mud. He heard the valves in his heart. He heard the quick feathering action of the, of the hinges. Extraordinary, he thought. As he came up, a pair of red flares puffed open, a soft blurry glow, and in the glow he saw Kiowa's wide open eyes settling down into the scum. All he could do was watch. He heard himself moan. Then he moved again, crabbing forward, but when he got there, Kiowa was almost completely under. There was a knee, there was an arm, and a gold wrist watch, and part of a boot. He could not describe what happened next, not ever, but he would have tried anyway. He would have spoken carefully so as to make it real for anyone who would listen. There were bubbles where Kiowa's head should have been.
The left hand was curled open. The fingers were filthy. The rest watch, wrist watch gave off, gave off a green phosphorescent shine as it slipped beneath the thick waters. He would have talked about this and how he grabbed Kiowa by the boot and tried to pull him out. He pulled hard, but Kiowa was gone, and then suddenly he felt himself going too. The shit was in his nose and his eyes. There were flares and mortar rounds, and the stink was everywhere. It was inside him, in his lungs, and he could no longer tolerate it. Not here, he thought. Not like this. He released Kiowa's boot and watched it slide away. Slowly working its way up, he hoisted himself out of the deep mud, and then he lay still and tasted the shit in his mouth and closed his eyes and listened to the rain and explosions and bubbling sounds. He was alone. He had lost his weapon, but it didn't matter. All he wanted was a bath. Nothing else. A hot, soapy bath. Circling the lake, Norman Bowker remembered how his friend Kiowa had disappeared under the waste and water. I didn't flip out, he would have said. I was cool. If things had gone right, if it hadn't been for the smell, I could have won the Silver Star. A good war story, he thought, but it was not a war for war stories, nor for talk of valor. Nobody in town wanted to hear about the terrible stink. They wanted good intentions and good deeds, but the town was not to blame, really. It was a nice little town, very prosperous, with neat houses and all the sanitary conveniences. Norman Bowker lit a cigarette and cranked open his window. 7.35, he decided. The lake was divided into two halves. One half still glistened, the other was caught in shadow. Along the causeway, the two little boys marched on. The man in the stalled motorboat yanked, fr yanked frantically on the cord to his engine, and the two mud hens sought supper at the bottom of the lake, tails bobbing. He passed Sunset Park once again, and more houses, and the junior college, and the tennis courts, and the picnickers, who now sat waiting for the evening fireworks. The high school band was gone. The woman in pedal pushers toyed with her line. Although it was not yet dusk, the A&W was already awash in neon lights. He maneuvered his father's Chevy into one of the parking slots, let the engine idle, and sat back. The place was doing a good holiday business. Mostly kids, it seemed, and a few farmers in for the day. He did not recognize any of the faces. A slim, hipless young car hop passed by, but when he hit the horn, she did not seem to notice. Her eyes slid sideways. She hooked a tray to the window of a firebird, laughing lightly, leaning forward to chat with the three boys inside. He felt invisible in the soft twilight. Straight ahead, over the takeout counter, swarms of mosquitoes electrocuted themselves against an aluminum pest-rid machine. It was a calm, quiet summer evening. He honked again, this time leaning on the horn. The young car hop turned slowly as if puzzled and said something to the boys and the firebird and moved reluctantly toward him. Pinned to her shirt was a badge that said, Eat Mama Burgers. When she reached his window, she stood straight up so all he could see was the badge. Mama Burger, he said. Maybe some fries, too. The girl sighed, leaned down, and shook her head. Her eyes were fluffy and airy, light as cotton candy. You blind, she said. She put out her hand and tapped an intercom attached to a steel post. Punch the button and place your order. All I do is carry the dumb trays. She stared at him for a moment. Briefly, he thought, a question lingered in her fuzzy eyes. But then she turned and punched the button for him and returned to her friends in the Firebird. The intercom squeaked and said, Order. Mama Burger and Fries, Norman Bowker said. Affirmative. Copy clear. No Rudy Tootie? Rudy Tootie? You know, man. Root beer. A small one. Roger Dodger. Repeat. One Mama, one Fries, one small beer. Fire for effect. Stand by. The intercom squeaked and went dead. Out, said Norman Bowker. When the girl brought his tray, he ate quickly without looking up. The tired announcer in Des Moines gave the time, almost 8.30. Dark was pressing in tight now, and he wished there was somewhere to go. In the morning, he'd check out job possibilities, shoot a few buckets down at the Y, maybe wash the Chevy. He finished his root beer and pushed the intercom button. Order, said the tinny voice. All done. That's it? I guess so. Hey, loosen up, the voice said. What you really need, friend? Norman Bowker smiled. Well, he said, how'd you like to hear about... He stopped and shook his head. Hear what, man? Nothing. Well, hey, the intercom said. I'm sure as F not going anywhere. Screwed to a post, for God's sake. Go ahead, try me. Nothing. You sure? Positive. All done. The intercom made a light sound of disappointment. Your choice, I guess. Over and out. Out, said Norman Bowker. 
On his tenth turn around the lake, he passed the hiking boys for the last time. The man in the stalled motorboat was gone. The mud hens were gone. Beyond the lake, over Sally Gustafson's house, the sun had left a smudge of purple on the horizon. The band shell was deserted, and the woman in pedal pushers were quietly reeled in her line, and Dr. Mason's sprinkler went round and round. On his eleventh revolution, he switched off the air conditioning, opened up his window, and rested his elbow comfortably on the sill, driving with one hand. There was nothing to say. He could not talk about it and never would. The evening was smooth and warm. If it had been possible, which it was, then he would have explained how his friend Kyo was slipped away that night beneath the dark, swampy field. He was folded in with the war. He was part of the waste. Turning on his headlights, driving slowly, Norman Bowker remembered how he had taken hold of Kiowa's boot and pulled hard, but how the smell was simply too much and how he'd backed off and in that way had lost the Silver Star. He wished he could have explained some of this, how he had been braver than he ever thought possible, but how he had not been so brave as he wanted to be. The distinction was important. Max Arnold, who loved fine lines, would have appreciated it, and his father, who already knew, would have nodded. The truth, Norman Bowker would have said, is I let the guy go. Maybe he was already gone. He wasn't. But maybe. No, I could feel it. He wasn't. Some things you can feel. His father would have been quiet for a while, watching the headlights along the narrow tar road. Well, anyways, the old man would have said, there's still the seven medals, I suppose. Seven honeys. Right. On his twelfth revolution... The sky went crazy with color. He pulled into Sunset Park and stopped in the shadow of a picnic shelter. After a time, he got out, walked down to the beach, and waded into the lake without undressing. The water felt warm against his skin. He put his head under. He opened his lips very slightly for the taste, and then he stood up and folded his arms and watched the fireworks. For a small town, he decided it was a pretty good show. So it says his father likes silence. His father had his own war, so he probably hasn't had a chance to talk to his father about all this. And now at the end, it, um, it's like a bath. He said all he wanted was a bath when he was over there in the um, outdoor village toilet. Um, so he goes and just goes in the water and watches the fireworks. Now this next one, notes, is related to this. This starts on page 149 if you have the book. Speaking of Courage was written in 1975 at the suggestion of Norman Bowker, who three years later hanged himself in the locker room of the YMCA in his hometown in central Iowa. In the spring of 1975, near the time of Saigon's final collapse, I received a long disjointed letter in which Bowker described the problem of finding a meaningful use for his life after the war. He'd worked briefly as an automotive parts salesman, a janitor, a car wash attendant, and a short order cook at the local a w fast food franchise. None of these jobs, he said, had lasted more than 10 weeks. He lived with his parents, who supported him and who treated him with kindness and obvious love. At one point, he'd enrolled in a junior college in his hometown, but the coursework, he seemed, seemed too abstract, too distant, and with nothing real or tangible at stake, certainly not the stakes of war. He dropped out after eight months. He spent his mornings in bed. In the afternoon, he played pickup basketball at the Y, and then at night, he drove around town in his father's car, mostly alone or with a six-pack of beer, cruising. The thing is, he wrote, there's no place to go, not just in this lousy little town, in general. My life, I mean, it's almost like I got, I got killed over in Nam. Hard to describe. That night when Kiowa got wasted, I sort of sank down into the sewage with him. Feels like I'm still in deep shit. The letter covered 17 handwritten pages, its tone jumping from self-pity to anger to irony to guilt to a kind of feigned indifference. He didn't know what to feel. In the middle of the letter... He, for example, he reproached himself for complaining too much. God, this is starting to sound like some jerking, jerk-off vet crying in his beer. Sorry about that. I'm no basket case. Not even any bad dreams. And I don't feel like anybody mistreats me or anything, except perhaps some people act too nice, too polite, like they're afraid they might ask the wrong question. But I shouldn't bitch. One thing I hate, really hate, is all those whiner vets. Guys sniveling about how they didn't get any parades. Such absolute crap. I mean, who in his right mind wants a parade or getting his back clapped by a bunch of patriotic idiots who don't know jack about what it feels like to kill people or get shot at or sleep in the rain or watch your buddy go down underneath the mud? Who needs it? 
anyhow, I'm basically a okay home free. So why not come down for a visit sometimes and we'll chase girls and shoot the breeze and tell each other old war lies. A good long bull session, you know. I felt it coming. Near the end of the letter, it came. He explained he had read my first book, If I Die in a Combat Zone, which he had liked except for the bleeding heart political parts. For half a page, he talked about how much the book had meant to him, how it brought back all kinds of memories, the villes and patties and rivers, and how he recognized most of the characters, including himself, even though almost all the names were changed. Then Balker came straight out with it. What you should do, Tim, is write a story about a guy who feels like he got zapped over in that shithole. A guy who can't get his act together and just drives around town all day and can't think of any damn place to go and doesn't know how to get there anyway. The guy wants to talk about it, but he can't. If you want, you can use this stuff in this letter, but not my real name, okay? I'd write it myself, except I can't ever find any words, if you know what I mean, and I can't figure out what exactly to say. Something about the field that night the way Kiowa just disappeared into the crud. You were there. You can tell it. Norman Bowker's letter hit me hard. For years I'd felt a certain smugness about how easily I'd made the shift from war to peace. A nice smooth glide, no flashbacks or midnight sweats. The war was over, after all, and the thing to do was go on. So I took pride in sighting gracefully from Vietnam to graduate school, from Quang Nai to Harvard, from one world to another. In ordinary conversation, I never spoke much about the war, certainly not in detail. And yet, ever since my return, I've been talking about it virtually nonstop through my writing. Telling stories seemed a natural, inevitable process, like clearing the throat. Partly catharsis, partly communication. It was a way of grabbing people by the shirt and explaining exactly what had happened to me, how I'd allowed myself to get dragged into a wrong war, all the mistakes I'd made, all the terrible things I had seen and done. I did not look on my work as therapy, and still don't. Yet when I received Norman Bowker's letter, it occurred to me that the act of writing had led me through a swirl of memories that might otherwise have ended in paralysis or worse. By telling stories, you objectify your own experience. You separate it from yourself. You pin down certain truths. You make up others. You start sometimes with an incident that truly happened, like the night in the shit field. And you carry it forward by inventing incidents that did not, in fact, occur, but that nonetheless helped to clarify and explain. In any case, Norman Bowers, Bowker's letter had an effect. It haunted me for more than a month. Not the words so much as its desperation, and I resolved finally to take him up on his story suggestion. At the time, I was at work on a new novel, Going After Cotziato. And one morning, I sat down and began a, title, a chapter titled Speaking of Courage. The emotional core came directly from Bowker's letter, the simple need to talk. To provide a dramatic frame, I collapsed events into a single time and place, a car circling a lake on a quiet afternoon in midsummer, using the lake as a nucleus around which the story would orbit. As he'd requested, I did not use Norman Bowker's name, instead sub substituting the name of my novel's main character, Paul Berlin. For the scenery, I borrowed heavily from my own hometown. Wholesale thievery, in fact. I lifted up Worthington, Minnesota. The lake, the road, the causeway, the woman and pedal pushers, the junior college, the handsome houses, the docks and boats and public parks. And carried it all a few hundred miles south. Oof. And transplanted it into the Iowa prairie. The writing went quickly and easily. I drafted the piece in a week or two, fiddled with it for another week, and then published it as a separate short story. Almost immediately, though, there was a sense of failure. The details of Norman Bowker's story were missing. In this original version, which I still conceived as part of the novel, I'd been forced to omit the shit field and the rain and the death of Kiowa, replacing this material with the events that better fit the book's narrative. As a consequence, I'd lost the natural counterpoint between the lake and the field. See, taking the bath in the lake, because you know, he was in the field. There's a counterpoint between the lake and the field. A metaphoric unity was broken. What the piece needed, and did not have, was the terrible killing power of that shit field. As the novel developed over the next year, and as my own ideas clarified, it became apparent the chapter had no proper home in the larger narrative. Going after Cacciato was a war story. Speaking of Courage was a post-war story. Two different time periods, two different sets of issues. There was no choice but to remove the chapter entirely. The mistake, in part, had been trying to wedge the piece into a novel. Beyond that, though, something about the story had frightened me. 
I was afraid to speak directly, afraid to remember. In the end, the piece had been ruined by a failure to tell the full and precise truth about our night in Ed Shitfield. Over the next several months, as it often happens, I managed to erase the story's flaws from my memories, taking pride in a shadowy, idealized recollection of its virtues. When the piece appeared in an anthology of short fiction, I sent a copy off to Norman Bowker with the thought that it might please him. His reaction was short and somewhat bitter. It's not terrible, he wrote me, but you left out Vietnam. Where's Kiowa? Where's the shit? Eight months later, he hanged himself. In August of 1978, his mother sent me a brief note explaining what had happened. He'd been playing pickup basketball at the Y. After two hours, he went off for a drink of water. It's not you, it's me. Um, he used a jump rope. His friends found him hanging from a water pipe. There was no suicide note, no message of any kind. Norman was a quiet boy, his mother wrote, and I don't suppose he wanted to bother anybody. Now, a decade after his death, I'm hoping that speaking of courage makes good on Norman Bowker's silence, and I hope it's a better story. Although the old structure remains, the piece has been substantially revised, in some places by severe cutting, in other places by the addition of new material. Norman is back in the story, where he belongs, and I don't think he would mind that his real name appears. The Central Incident our long night in the shit field along the Song Trebong has been restored to the piece. It was hard stuff to write. Kiowa, after all, had been a close friend, and for years I've avoided thinking about his death and my own complicity in it. Even here, it's not easy. In the interest of truth, however, I want to make it clear that Norman Bowker was in no way responsible for what happened to Kiowa. Norman did not experience a failure of nerve that night. He did not freeze up or lose the Silver Star for Valor. That part of the story is my own. All right, so those are the chapters, and there's going to be some questions on Schoology, so make sure you do those, and um, I will see you next week.